All right, welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today our guest is Marcos Ochoa. Marcos was born and raised in Chicago's South Side. After doing theater around the country, he moved to Los Angeles to pursue TV and film. Marcos worked his way up, joining SAG-AFTRA and guest starring on several television shows, including Troll Show, The Joe Schmo Show, Nathan For You, and Game Shakers. Marcos has appeared in many indie films, including Wild and Blue, where he won the Best Supporting Actor at the International Berlin Festival. One of his greatest accomplishments was being cast by Academy Award winners Joel and Ethan Cohen to play the role singing, dancing, and acting with Tatum Cat Tatum in Hail Caesar. Next, Marcos can be seen in Richard and Danny Elfman's next feature film, Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks, which will be awesome. Marcos, we're so excited to have you here on the show today. Um, let me hand you the microphone, and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, what I wanted to talk to you about is that as an actor, we all have a mission, to, of course, to get a role and to have a budding career over a year's time. But what, we, what a lot of people don't talk about is the idea of failing. And I'm trying to, I'm going to put a positive spin on this because failing is part of the process. And so it is about preparing to fail. And it's okay. It's okay. We're all nervous. We get nervous for many things, big and small. But it's a relief when what we were nervous about is over and we reflect and say, that's it. Okay. Like, let's do it again. Okay, great. So auditions, you will always have nerves. Same people with, you know, who have go into traditional job interviews, you'll always have nerves. But the best way to combat them is preparation. The more you're prepared, the more, you, more focused you are achieving the goal. And actor, actors, when they go into an audition room, they have at most like two minutes to show what they have. And you use those, that small amount of time to prove who you are and what they want. And also a director has a problem to solve. Uh, you know, who is going to be this part or this role? You know, so it's up to you to solve their problem. And you know, they want you to do well. Like they, you know, you don't go into a room and you're not, and you know, whether, you know, whoever the director or producer or whatever it is, they, they really do want you to do well because they want, they want to move forward and get, get the ball rolling. So now all auditions are not, you know, perfect. And what I mean by that is you're going to have some bad ones and that's okay. Um, of course, you want it all to be great. You want it to go without a hitch. You want it to be perfect. Um, but so, and that's why you need to go out and fail successfully. And what I mean by that is that you should plan on going on hundreds of auditions and hearing 200 no's. I'm not being a pessimist. It's most likely what you will, you will most likely you definitely will hear a yes at some point, but rejection is 99% of the business. So it's okay if you don't get the call back a roll. What you do is you just brush it off and focus on what you could have done better and put that energy into the next audition. Uh, I, I can count on many times where I was, I was like, wow, oh my gosh. I Because you know, sometimes you have to do singing or you have to you know, say lines or, and you want to make sure you get the right notes out. And you know, you, you, you're singing at eight in the morning or whatever time it is, and your voice is just not there. And so you're, you're giving all your gut and you're just like, oh, well, like, thank you very much. I'll see you next time, you know, or, you know, hope, you know, and uh, so it's, it's, yeah. So it's better to just like brush it off and focus on the next audition. And the important thing is to always be professional. I mean, they're, they're not, they aren't only looking for a character, but they, they want to work with someone who will be a great addition to the ensemble. You know, so you have to like leave the personal negative thoughts at the door. And introduce yourself, you know, be polite, uh, be s someone that they might want to call a friend professionally. Um, and then, you know, you do the audition and then you leave gracefully, even if you think you totally sunk the audition. You know, you just leave completely gracefully and say, thank you for your time. And then you move on. Um, a wife, and then, 
And then of course, what's going through your head as you have the audition, you're like, oh gosh, like that was awful. And you're still smiling and you're like, thank you. But you're like, ah. a wise teacher once told me in the car, I asked, what does that mean? She said, she's a, she was a fantastic, she was actually like the inspiration as to why uh, I got into this business. It was because she was my show choir director and music teacher and uh, back in high school. And um, she said, if you have anything negative to say about yourself or someone who is in the audition room, in the waiting room, et cetera, in the car, meaning, you wait into a wait until you're in a space where absolutely no one can hear you, you know, because you fake, face it, you're going to be very protective. Our, our initial thing is to protect ourselves, like our egos. We have very fragile egos. So it's important to keep all those negative and positive thoughts to yourself because what if it went really well and you're coming out and you're saying like, oh my God, that was amazing. You're saying this all out loud to a bunch of other people who are in an audition room who don't want to hear it. They, they don't want to hear it at all. <laughs> and so the thing is, it's like you, you audition, no matter how it goes, you say thank you to everybody, you leave pleasantly, you go blocks away or wherever your car is, you go in the car and then you vent it out <laughs> and then you move forward. So you just want to sort of keep those you know, thoughts to yourself because you want to respect others in the audition waiting room or the audition room. So you exit professionally as if it was a job at a prestigious law firm or, you know, just another job of a lifetime where you're going to be not only representing yourself, but representing tons of people. Um, so now you as an actor, you, you don't really know what they want. You, you really don't really know. Um, I've overheard writers in an audition room as they were, as I was waiting outside to go in and I could hear them still actually trying to figure out a character. That was an interesting thing was that they were trying to figure out who is this person? What, why this person? So I maybe like was kind of, you know, casually like overhearing, like, what are they saying? You know, what's going on? And um, so I took that, I took what I prepared and for what I was, how I was gonna read the role or how I was gonna do it. And then I sort of posited that info into my thing to make sure that I just added a little bit of more to my preparation. So you use, so I used it and made sure that I was prepared because preparation is the biggest thing. The more you're prepared for the role, whether it's like you're singing a song, a monologue, reading you know, a two person scene, you, uh, you have to be absolutely prepared. And um, it's good to know the research of like, who's the director, who's the producer, what do they like? What were their past projects? You know, I mean, uh, we all know that, uh, unfortunately today we lost the comedy legend, uh, Carl Reiner. And he, if, if you were to go into, if you were fortunate to go into a room with that, you know, to read for him, you know, to somebody like him or that caliber, you know, generations of experience, there is so much material for you to look at and say, okay, these are the people that he, not people, but these are the characters that he has casted. So how can you not, you don't necessarily want to mock those characters, but you want to see how can I fit in to that? So there's just all this material that you can, get after and with of course with the beauty of the internet and with youtube and everything you can go and look at materials all over the place where for you know prior to my existence in the professional world we really that that really wasn't possible you had to sort of remember like okay what did they do on that television show or movie or whatever um i would say so most importantly um audition as many times as you can Auditioning is a job in itself, and you need to get really, really good at it. You know, keep your body and mind in shape, exercise as best as you can physically and mentally to prepare for the next opportunity. Uh, re I, and as, as I said just before, with uh, the example of Carnal Reiner, research the directors and producers and their prior projects. Um, leave no stone unturned to getting that part. You know, you don't necessarily want to go in fully blind. I mean, of course, I know there's sometimes improv involved, but you still kind of want to have ammo 
in a way to of what you can use what can you just pull out and be like and and entertain them you know because eventually hundreds of prepared and improved auditions will pay off and eventually those no's will turn into yeses because you can have a hundred no's that's fine um but it really just takes like a couple you know just one or two yeses to completely change your career trajectory so that is why i say go out and fail learn from learn from those failings and but the true thing is is that because you're going out there as an actor and actually entertaining somebody for one or two minutes you're using your craft and you are able to learn from that and get better every time right i i love this message marcos because uh, preparing to fail i mean you're talking about it in the context of being an actor but this is something that applies to us at, at every stage of our life and no matter what your profession is i mean i fail all the time um, and I think this is an, an especially important message for kids like in high school, because that's a part where, you know, when you're in your, those formative years, you feel vulnerable and a lot of kids are afraid to fail. And so they don't audition for the school musical. They don't go out for the basketball team. They don't try to join a new club or an organization. And I think the sooner you can fail, the better off you'll be. Um, if you think back to your childhood, were there any things that you tried that maybe you weren't successful at right away that maybe prepared you better for that thing later in your life? I would have to say something that, uh, honestly, it was probably, I wasn't necessarily a, well, no, I don't, I'll take that back. Uh, it was, it would be like public speaking. Hmm. Um, and I necessarily wasn't terrified of me speaking. It was about like, how would, the audience or like my classmates, how would they react to me? You know, what, you know, because I was a, you know, in my, you know, pre-pubescent or, you know, like going through puberty, I, it, it was not an attractive sight. I will tell you that it was not. So I was very, very self-conscious being in front of people. And, but of course we had to give presentations, you know, grow, you know, in, in like junior high and, and, uh, further on and it was I would be nervous about it and but then I would just do it and but the and the goal the key that I realized what helped me was that making sure that I had a lot to talk about so I wasn't and so my project that I had to give whether it was on you know I don't know uh, volcanoes <laughs> or some sort of uh, you know biology biological chemical some sort of you know, homework that, I, you know, that I wasn't, wasn't necessarily near and dear to me, but it was something that I had to be fully prepared in order to make sure that I, I was able to teach and, but was able to um, speak in a way that was, uh, that would communicate well to others. So the more I realized I did that, public speaking does not bother me at all. All. I know it's like one of those things where it's like the, one of the number one fears. It's like public speaking and death of like being one of the number one fears. I don't, I actually, I don't mind public speaking at all. It, and I think it was because of all those times where I was just, I had to go up there looking weird, um, talking weird, voice cracking, all that stuff. And then talking about a subject that I really wasn't, you know, too passionate about, but it was those really un- I don't want to say unsuccessful, but it was really those, uh, you know, uh, uh, ones that had a lot of hurdles to battle that made it easier as I got older. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that's hard too is for, especially for kids that are growing up and they're changing and things, you know, doing new things, they forget that everyone else is experiencing that th same thing, that everyone else is feeling awkward. I, I, I was just thinking as you were talking about this, my first public performance was when I was in junior high, I sang in a quartet for the talent show. And we sang A Whole New World from Aladdin. And I, I have a low voice, but I was singing a high part. And I got to the high part here in junior high and totally cracked on this high note. And it was, I mean, it was mortifying. But then I got done and I thought everyone would make fun of me. One, everyone thought it was the other guy. So <laughs> I, he took the blame, but then, you know, no one cared. I cared a lot and it was embarrassing for me for a moment, but everyone else had moved on the minute it happened, you know, and 
kids right. forget that sometimes. Oh, right. Yeah, completely. And, and unless there's like, you know, uh, a YouTube of it, you know, later on. Or <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But yeah, no. And, you know, actually, that's I'm glad you brought up a talent show because when I was younger, um, I actually did not go out for the talent shows in grade school because I, I really did feel like I didn't really have a talent to sort of portray, um, even though people were just dancing in a square, you know, I mean, you look back and you're like, wow, that was what I was afraid of going up against. So it's, it's really funny that unless you do it, you don't know. So it's like, you never know until you try. Right. And I think going back to your whole message, I think a lot of the value, I look back at those talent shows and things like that. And it really didn't make me a better person to have performed or, or anything like that. The value was in auditioning. The value was in trying to do something that was hard. And because I did those things and failed, there were so many things I tried out for that I got cut from the team or I didn't make it. I didn't get the part I wanted. But those things made me more resilient. So now as an adult, I, I have no problem trying new things and, and going to new places and applying for new kinds of jobs and, and things like that. And so it, it really serves you well in life. Um, what we haven't talked about yet is the role of other people in this. So when you're talking about trying new things and, and preparing to fail, we can increase our chances of being successful. And you talked about the preparation stage of really knowing your lines and really going in and knowing the people you're talking to. What's the role of other people in that preparation? Do you involve other people when you're preparing for an audition or, or networking or anything like that? How, how do you use other people in your success? Well, I'm lucky to have my husband, who is also a, a very talented actor and a director and a writer as well. And uh, he um, is, luckily we're both uh, at home, <laughs> sheltering at home together. So when I've had to do auditions, because um, so, self-tapes are now a big thing, they were, they were starting to grow, of course, before everything, but now that we're all at home, we all have to self-tape a lot. Right. And so therefore, um, having him read other scenes with me, super helpful, because if you're kind of, if you're reading it in a vacuum, it's not as, um, it's not as beneficial. It, I mean, it, it, of course, you have to use whatever you've got, you know, in these times, but right. it's, it's very fortunate that I have somebody who is in the same field to, um, to work with. Um, and then in regards to with other people, it's, um, it, I'm able to, like, I have a really close friend, uh, Jessica, who lives in Chicago. She's also an actress um, who's done a lot of commercials and TV, too. And she, um, if I have, if I have, it's, I, I love the, the opinion of my husband, but I also want another opinion. So I'll send her a link to, you know, I'll upload the video, you know, for a private listening on YouTube or through WeTransfer so she can download it and be like, okay, tell me what you think. And then I say, and then she gives me the honest critique and then I go from there, you know? So if it, uh, so it's just using those things. And then also um, using um, people, uh, you know, friends who've directed things like that. Like what is something that you would want to see more of from this? Like, am I communicating? is this role coming out to you? Like, are you seeing me read it? Or are you seeing the character? Um, and that's what's really important because I think the best, I think the best performances that I've seen in movies and in plays is when I completely forget that I'm watching that actor. Um, you know, we say that we, you know, we could say that about um, like Daniel Day-Lewis. He completely transforms himself into every role. I mean, he goes and he really, really goes a distance. Um, and I'll see, you know, like other actors like John Leguizamo, like um, Steve Buscemi. I mean, you're, you're, you see, you don't see them as themselves. You see, or of course, Meryl Streep, we, you know, we can go hours, you can go eons about her and you're, you forget the actor and you start to remember the character. And that to me is always a goal of, of being completely separate. So if someone were to meet, so say if I had you know, some role that went on for years on TV or, and, uh, or streaming, and they would say, oh, you're completely different from your character. I'll be like, awesome. 
thank you. you know, especially if I'm playing like, you know, a serial killer or something. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm like the next Dexter, I don't know. But, you know, I'd be like, well, yeah, I hope so. But no, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So it's, it's really nice to sort of, I, I think, yeah, going, you, you just kind of want to disappear into a character and then be yourself when you're at home. Yeah. yeah, I love that. There's a couple things that you mentioned there that I want to touch on. The, the first is when you are home and right now everybody's home, right? And so take <laughs> advantage of that. You have resources in your case, using your husband and getting that honest feedback. And, and I would guess, I don't know this, but I would guess working with him in that capacity has improved your relationship because you're working with each other. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great because we get to work with each other. He, you know, developed um, his own um, acting method um, called uh, the New American Method, where he works with um, verbs, and he 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 basically places verbs on actionable verbs onto each line. So you actually take a text analysis and dissect what each line is saying, not just like what we're saying out loud, but what's the subtext of it. You know, because as humans, we're very manipulative. You know, we very, we very much like, you know, even when we're kids or, or babies even, you know, it's like we, uh, uh, when a baby cries, it's not just crying. And as you know, there's mean behind it. Is that a hungry cry? Is that I got to be changed cry? Is that a tension? You know, there's so many things to where we communicate to where it's very... Um, there's so many subtexts to it. So when a character who is, you know, a, 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 when there's this amazing character that you get to play, what are they really trying to say? What are they really con conveying? Um, oh gosh, I was just watching, um, I watched Joker again with Joaquin Phoenix for like the, I don't know, you know, several, several times. And um, to me, it reminds me of uh, the movie Taxi Driver. Um, I love Taxi I've seen Taxi Driver probably hundreds of times too. And I just, those characters, it's where there's just like, oh my God, like you see them as evil people, but then part of me sees them as like, gosh, they really just need to be loved. They need like love. Like, the, and I'm not saying that like, oh, I can fix them. It's not about that. It's just about there. there's more to them than just being this criminal or there's, there's so many layers to dissect. And I think that's why we end up becoming so attached to why to these characters why why we say travis fickle from taxi driver why we know that you know uh, and arthur from joker why we know him and why he will be known for for a long time right. um yeah so i i love in this interview you've done this more than maybe anyone i've had on so far you're totally geeking out about your craft like totally <laughs> getting into it. and I, I love it because there's a lesson in that for you kids who are watching this if you want to have success and no matter what your chosen profession is or whatever, you have to find those things about your business. You have to find those things about, you know, who you want to be, whatever your goals are. And, and it's totally cool to immerse yourself in that and totally geek out on that and, and think about, you know, how would I be in that situation and, and doing that visualization? I mean, Marcos, I love how you're kind of doing that in this interview, like you're kind of reminiscing <laughs> on these things, because that's what we all need to be doing to be successful in, in our profession. So that's really cool. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's great. And I, I think I'm and the thing is, too, is that what I love about like YouTube and things like that, I will rewatch scenes over and over of, you know, actors that I love, because it's just, oh, it's it's just so it's rewarding and it's I think in times like this it's kind of comforting to have that something that we can always control because it's something that we can look at for a certain period of time and then come back to the real world engage in that and then disappear for a bit it, it's something that sort of keeps us it's kind of one of those things where it's maybe it's part of my routine of where not only do I exercise at home and then you know have some sort of something that makes me happy mentally because we are so inundated with negativity going on that we need to have some sort of happiness whether it's a youtube video or play i have a dog we have a dog and mm -hmm. my dog is he's funny he's a crazy dog mm -hmm. and we i mean I, I would say that he's I mean, and i'm not trying i won't go into too much of a tangent of my dog but you know he's he is 
as playful as like a rambunctious child, meaning that he he has such a personality that is is just like I don't. It's like if you were my child, I would believe you were my child because he just is very much like no, I don't want to do that. Okay, fine, I want to play now. Like it's just it, it, he reminds me of me, even though. You know, I, we just happened to uh, find him on the street and we adopted him and it was, you know, seven years later, he's still around and he's, he's got a personality and we, yeah, he, so, you know, there's just, I'm going off about my dog, but, uh, <laughs> but we, we, uh, we, I think we just, it's just so important in these times to find slivers of happiness because, and to improve ourselves while we wait, and most importantly, stay as healthy as possible. Right, well, Marcos, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. It's been a lot of fun to, to hear, well, first, to, to get that message on preparing to fail. I think that's such an important lesson for kids, but it's been fun to just kind of gl a glimpse into your life as well. Um, if kids want to follow your career or if they want to connect with you on social media or something like that, where's the best place to find you online? Let's see, uh, best place to find me online would be, my uh, website would be uh, marcosmateoochoa.com. Or you can find, you can look up my name, uh, Marcos Mateo Ochoa on IMDB. Uh, that, I love that site. <laughs> That's one of my favorite sites to go to, jokes of all the movie trivia. I'm a big movie trivia nerd uh, too. So um, yeah. Uh, that's the best place. Yeah, one of, those are two of the best places to find that's me. That's awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today. All right. Thank you so much.